Amen. Thank you, worship team. Uh, singing what we believe. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, and if you're new with us, my name's David. I love being one of the pastors around here. And we're working our way through Luke, but it's always fun when there's some other activities that are happening around here. And so it was fun. You heard Meg mention it. Uh, thrilling to see our women gather to share life, to be together, to uh, share stories that our women's conference was was primarily dedicated to our people sharing their stories. We do that every Sunday. We gather, we, we sing songs, we tell stories around here, uh, we hear a sermon, and then we are sent back out to be the living proof of a loving God. That, that is what we do week in, week out. And so it was fun to hear that our women's ministry did that as well. And, uh, and coming up is the greatest story ever told. Uh, we get to celebrate Easter in a few weeks. And, and the beauty about Christianity, every other religion is about making bad people good. Christianity is about making dead people alive. It, it is profound that Jesus changes death to life. And so we get to celebrate 8, 8 9.30, and 11. And, uh, and 9.30 might be slammed. And so if you happen to choose 8 or 11, that would also be uh, something encouraging to me um, to make room for those that might be exploring this journey with Jesus. Two times a year, we do more of an outward-facing uh, invitation, and that is Easter and Christmas. In addition to celebrating Easter, we also celebrate Good Friday at 5 and 6.30. Kids ministry will be at 5.00. Um, and there will be elementary or fifth, fifth elementary up to fifth grade. Aaron could correct me or someone in kids ministry. Uh, maybe there's some more intense imagery or video of this death and crucifixion of our savior. And so taking time to pause and reflect on the brutality of what Jesus went through to ransom our lives. And so looking forward to celebrating. You can head to hillcrestbiblechurch.com slash Easter to see a little bit more of all those things taking place. And we have been in Holy Week for a significant amount of time this spring. We have been looking about that Passion Week, about that Holy Week for the past few weeks. And so if you guys remember, Sunday, this was a few weeks ago, Jesus entered. And and Luke does something beautiful. He talks about the triumphal entry, but he also tags it with, Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. He shows us this compassion. Jesus knows what's about to happen. The destruction of the temple, the destruction of the city. And so he's weeping for these people. He wants to come to know him. And then on Monday, he cleans house. He turns tables. This spiritual renewal, this spiritual reality of of what's taking place, of, of what it means to truly worship. And then on Tuesday, we walk through this uh, for a few weeks, these different escalating issues where they're trying to, the religious leaders trying to trap Jesus. And, and we walk through that. Uh, whose authority, whose allegiance, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God's what is God's. And then whose wife in the resurrection, Ryan did a great job lifting our eyes that what the future is going to be is beyond what we can comprehend and better than we can comprehend, like a whale, trying to explain the internet to a whale, if you remember that illustration. And then Brian did a great job last week, uh, Spy Wednesday. Not much that we know of happens other than Judas goes to the chief priests and uh, commits to betraying Jesus, Spy Wednesday. And, And then Brian did a great job last week lifting our eyes to the Lord's Supper, the scope, the magnitude, and he also referenced Vikings and Packer fans. Uh, Just a reminder, we Vikings fans give you Packer fans a chance for humility every time one of those illustrations is brought up. Uh, but, But Brian lifted our eyes every time we take communion, past celebrating what was past, the architect of the Passover, uh, just desired to celebrate that with his disciples, instituting the Lord's Supper and what we celebrate. We don't simply, when we take communion, get in touch with our inner selves. We're celebrating a historical reality every time we participate in communion. And then this morning, Jesus, in that same scenario, is going to turn. If you remember, they argued about who's the greatest. And then now, we could imagine maybe the person instigating that question is who Jesus addresses in this section. These are his last words, last words of encouragement before it does become 
incredibly intense. And so here's his last words in that setting on Thursday night. Here's what he says. Immediately following, immediately following them arguing of who's the greatest, here's what Jesus says. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. And Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. And he said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. He said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it and likewise a knapsack and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak to buy one. For I tell you that the scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, look, Lord, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. Throughout Luke, we've seen Jesus call his disciples and they respond. Foxes have holes, birds have nests, son of man has nowhere to lay his head. Come and follow me. And they leave everything. The, the Luke tells us over and over this cost of following Jesus, and they, they leave everything. They, they give their lives to following Christ. And are we aware there are challenges in this journey of following Jesus, and there are times we fall. Is that true? The last words Jesus gives is an awareness to Peter that he will fall But it's not simply in him falling, but rather how he responds. That's where we're headed this morning. Luke has our certainty in mind and wants it to increase. We live everything. We leave everything to follow Jesus. But does that mean we won't fall at times in this ongoing spiritual journey? No, instead it does. It doesn't mean that we won't fall in this ongoing spiritual transformation. It's how we get up when we fall that makes all the difference. Jesus, in his last chance to encourage these guys before things get very serious, leaves them with a sense of what it means to continue to move forward in the midst of occasionally stumbling. So pray with me, and we will, we will jump in this morning. Oh, Jesus, you are so good to us uh, that we get to open your text. We get to freely come and gather and worship. Uh, I trust that what we share this morning is you speaking through me for, for our good. And, and if we are feeling challenged or pressed, uh, that maybe we are uh, not feeling the weight of grace and forgiveness that you intend, may these words to Peter, to the disciples, to us, uh, lift our eyes to the work that you did on the cross and the continued pursuit. It's not about falling. It is how we continue to get up. So reveal yourself this morning, always for your glory, we pray. Amen. Amen. So here's the flow this morning. Here's where we're walking through. There is a real spiritual enemy. Simon, Simon, Satan. We are not left alone though. Jesus prays on our behalf, and then we see Peter falls, but Peter will turn And then Jesus desires that our journey of faith encourage the faith of others as we keep moving forward. And so where's Jesus start? There is a real spiritual enemy. Here's what he says. Simon, Simon, behold Satan. Who is that? Who's he referencing? And, And so when you think of how people engage the spiritual world, it feels like there's five general ways that people engage the spiritual world. And the first, animism. If you're familiar with that, it's where you perceive everything has a spirit that plants, rocks, trees, these inanimate objects, as well as animate objects, animals, have a spirit. And so there's a sense of this spiritual world in everything, animism. On another hand, you might be a pantheist. This would be more new age and not necessarily you in the room, maybe, maybe. Uh, But pantheists would perceive that God is in everything, that everything is divine. That would be pantheism, a new age theology, kind of a mysticism, that everything is God. Or we treat science as God, and we dismiss any spiritual reality and, and instead view everything as material and can explain everything through some form of materialistic lens. 
and, and not believe in any spiritual life, just see it through this scientific grid. Uh, another one that feels like if maybe if you've grown up, there was a song I remember, The Devil Made Me Do It. I think that was like a song from the 70s or 80s in Christian subculture where you start focusing on evil spiritual feelings almost to an inappropriate degree where everything around every corner is now suddenly over the top focused, not wanting to give Satan more than what has been extended, but not less in this particular spiritual worldview, maybe you see Satan made me do it. And you go, no, you were just being a knucklehead. That's what happened in that situation. And, and here's the one that, that it feels like maybe has been true in, in my limited experience, uh, thinking of the Western evangelical world. We compartmentalize the spiritual world, and, and we divide things into the sacred and the secular. We, we divide things into the natural or supernatural. We compartmentalize our lives and uh, into this world or otherworldly, spiritual or material, rather than seeing it as an integration in, uh, in the spiritual world. So when Jesus says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you, we should read you all, right? They were having that argument about who's the greatest. Jesus now turns to you all. We don't see it in English, but you all Satan demanded to have you, and he demanded to whom? To whom did Satan demand? Jesus? Yeah. We see that. There's limited, limited power. He's demanding to God that he would have some ability to exercise control. And so we look around this world, this spiritual world, and we see Paul tells us in Ephesians 2 about that limited power as well as some other layers of this spiritual world that we are impacted by. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked. There is this brokenness that is pervasive in our life, that there is a need, there is sin in our life. And following the course of this world, we live in this broken world that because of the fall, there is a brokenness that exists. And then Paul also includes following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. We were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But to whom did Satan demand from? But God. That God is ultimately over any other circumstance and reality. That there is a being that Satan had to go through to exercise any sense of power. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. So what do you think of when you think of sifting? Think of that cute little like straining spaghetti. Is that what you think of? What do you think of when sifting? What comes to mind? Flour. Flour. So I, I don't, maybe this is something I should do. How do you sift flour? What do you do? Is that, again, same thing. You just kind of like sort out the flour and it's a cute little experience, kind of a nice, benign, nothing pretty intense, right? Is that true? I actually don't know. It gets everywhere. It explodes everywhere. Lori's trying to tell me right now. <laughs> Go for it. What does sifting flour mean? You roll the dough. There you go. And, and you do that, like kind of fluffing it up or something like that, or what do you do? <laughs> I don't know. This is a genuine question. You have an actual sifter that you put it in and it turns and it has and it like a sways and, oh, and nice. That's so cute. So maybe, that, maybe that's a better analogy, right? So sifting, it's just not something we do, or at least I don't do. Maybe this is speaking more about me. Divide, yes. I just buy them pre-made and you pop them in the oven and this that he might sift you like wheat. S sifting doesn't have too strong of a connotation for me. Maybe it does for you. But, but the intent is actually threshing. So, so if we can hear threshing or beating, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might thresh you like wheat. It's, it's less about sorting the wheat from the chaff and more about the procedure and the process for which it happens. 
Satan demanded to sift you, to beat you, to thresh you, that he might diminish your faith. And so the question is, how does Satan do that? How does Satan sift? And it feels like there's two ways that Satan goes about sifting. The first one is he just kind of lulls us to sleep. <laughs> that, that the process is actually, the beating or the threshing actually happens through comfort, lulling us to sleep to getting us to believe he's not real, doesn't exist. The other one, though, feels more primary, feels like the one we, we know more intimately that it's, it's when he brings challenging circumstances and pain into our lives. I don't think I have to tell anybody this life is challenging. That, that this is a challenging, challenging day-to-day grind that we sometimes experience. Simon, Simon, Satan demands to have you so that he would thresh you like wheat through challenging circumstances. Then Satan answered the Lord, Does Job, where do we see that? Where else do we see Satan asking for a certain amount of authority to sift and thresh someone? We see it in Job. Then Satan answered the Lord, does Job fear God for no reason? Have you not put a hedge around him in his house and all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. Take away what he has and he will curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, behold, All that he has is in your hands, only against him. Do not stretch out your hand. So Satan went from his presence of the Lord and began sifting Job. Jesus turns to Peter and says that same thing, that that you are being, you will be sifted, and yet I prayed for you. And so there is a real spiritual enemy, and yet Jesus says to Peter, you are not left alone. I'm praying for you. Here's what he says. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I have prayed that your faith may not fail. Now, here's the question. We, we know the story. Does Peter's faith fail? Does, does he actually give in? Jesus tells us that. Jesus said, I'm going to tell you, Peter, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. So, so ought we take from that Jesus' prayer wasn't effective? Did, did it not work? Did, did somehow Jesus pray and, and Peter wasn't protected from Satan's sifting? Instead, we see Jesus is aware that Peter will fall, but he prays that his faith will not fail. And when you have turned again, that Jesus is praying on Peter's behalf So that in the midst of the challenges, though Satan is using these circumstances against Peter, how is Jesus intending those very same circumstances? To draw Peter to himself. We see this in other verses. We see Jesus interceding for us. Here's how Paul talks about it in Romans. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. John tells us, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hands. And then the guy who experienced this circumstance writes these words later. Blessed be the God and father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, by whom? (laughs) By whom? By our own power? Who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Peter understood that when he fell, Jesus had prayed for him that though Satan was attempting to sift him, his faith didn't fail, guarded by God. And so we see Jesus knows we will fall, but praise on our behalf, we will not fail. Why? Though Satan is experiencing those or demonstrating or bringing that pain, Jesus wants us to recognize our vulnerability and need for him to draw us back to himself. And so I'd love to invite up Georgie uh, Halverson and Ryan and Aaron Horsberger to describe maybe what this 
journey has been like for them when sifted, their faith hadn't failed, and after experiencing God's grace, turned to help others. Hey, Aaron. Hey, Ryan. I'm Aaron Horsberger, and this is my husband, Ryan, and we have five kiddos. We live in Stoughton. This is Georgie. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I'm Georgie Halverson. Gary Halverson's my husband, so my better half is not here. Hmm. Feeling really vulnerable today without him up here because uh, I just, you know, he's uh, my person. Come on. And you might see Gary from time to time helps Jack with leading our worship from time to time. So, Aaron, Georgie, why don't you just tell us a little bit of this journey that you guys were on earlier uh, on where you saw maybe Satan attempting to sift you and what that experience was like, if you'd describe uh, for us what that journey was like. Yeah. Um, Ryan and I met when we were young, and we were young in our faith, and that was 20-some years ago. Um, we have experienced unbelievable, beautiful God moments in our life, just beautiful moments. But that is not without really, really hard struggles and really hard times to look at ourselves. And Ryan and I are very different. We come from different homes. We weren't raised in this environment. We're different. And honestly, he's kind of weird. (laughs) And I was in love with him. And the more that we fell in love together, the more those differences appeared, and the more struggles we had, and the more sin was, like, right in our faces. And we ended up arguing all the time. For hours a day, we would argue, and we didn't know how to communicate Hmm. healthy. We knew how to argue, and we knew how to point our fingers, and I knew how to blame Ryan And I knew how to attack him, and I knew how to not take responsibility. But I did not know how to sacrificially love someone. And I did not know how to love someone when I didn't feel in love with someone. And we were in an ugly spot. We were engaged, and I wasn't sure if I wanted to marry Ryan. We had some ugly, ugly sin surface in our relationship and I was angry and hurt and mad and we didn't know what to do we didn't know what to do and Ryan called the church for help so that's when they called called me and um (laughs) and somebody probably called Gary but we were both doing something at the time, but uh, they said, hey, there's this couple, they're new, you guys, they're kind of, they're in a tight spot, are you guys willing to to do that? And of course, we were like, absolutely, because that's, you know, Galatians 6 talks about carrying each other's burdens, right? So that's kind of what we did. We were like, yeah, it's not convenient right now, not even close. We had a lot going on, we had a lot of people living with us, we've had people living with us for like 17 years throughout that time. And so... Your kids, Georgie. Hmm? Your kids. Yeah, well, yeah, those are my kids. No, beyond (laughs) our kids. Yeah, we had these weird people living in our house. But, um, and so we had, you know, from day one of moving into our house. So, yeah, yeah, but Hmm. vulnerability help. We know vulnerability and like living transparent really helps us to see where we're lacking and the cracks in our own marriage. Um, so we were like, yeah, let's do this. Let's see what cracks we got, and let's help them out in the process. <laughs> so I remember getting in the car, and Ryan and I are in conflict, and we're outside of their house, and here we are. We don't know them, but here we are, Lord. We go inside, and we sit at the couch, and they prayed for us, and they were willing to hear us, They loved us without judging us, without shaming us. We argued in front of them. We cried in front of them. We processed in front of them. We struggled. We struggled in front of them. Where so many times we want to struggle away and change our appearance when other people enter. 
And Ryan and I argued in ways where we just argued like this, like pointing fingers at each other in constant circle. And in this argument, Gary and Georgie are like, whoa, stop. Is this how you guys communicate? Is this how you talk to each other? Is this, is this really? But we've heard this argument multiple times already. And you guys, what is going on? But we didn't know how to get out of that cycle. Mm. We didn't know how to do it, and we wanted to, but we couldn't figure it out, just the two of us. And they did know more than us, and they were willing to help us figure that out, how to communicate successfully and how not to point a finger at each other Hmm. and how not to attack each other. And we were making progress. We were making progress, but there was still something that I was so hurt and angry and mad that I I couldn't stop being angry at him. So we're sitting on the couch. Ryan and Aaron are over by the window. Gary. Yeah, Ryan and Aaron. Gary and Ryan, quiet. They're just kind of sitting there observing what's happening because I'm like, wow, this just got really intense really quick. And um, I was just like, Lord, help me because I'm not that smart. So you got to help me help her because I don't know. Because I was like, look, you sin. You sin every day. All of us sin and fall short of the glory of God every day. So like when we want to pick certain sins... Well, that's, that's not what the Bible says. That's not what Scripture says. It's one thing if Ryan's like, whatever, I want to do whatever I want to do. You know, like, he wasn't like that. So when I finally just said, look, do you want to be Satan holding the bat and beating Ryan when he's on the ground, or do you want to be Jesus and kneel down and help him up? And she was like, And it was just like an aha moment. Again, Mm -hmm. that was from God because I'm not that clever. Mm -hmm. Um, But, you know, it, she just, you had that aha moment. And even you guys over there were like, we all just kind of were like, whoa, like what's going on? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a pivotal moment. And I, I didn't share this in first service, but some of you know my story. Like I come from some real physical hurt in my past. And to think of myself like joining Satan and beating Ryan up because of the sin in mm. his life. Mm. What is my place? Like I had to make the choice. Either I was going to embrace my sin and let it be a throne and hold on to that power, or I was really going to hold on to Jesus and that power and step off of the throne. And I wouldn't have gotten to that point to see that if it wasn't for other people being willing to love me with hard love. Like, it's not easy. It wasn't easy. We would cry, and I would leave angry and mad, and, mm. but it was needed. It was needed for us to move past that cycle that we were stuck in. And we stumble, and um, sometimes we still need help to get up and move forward, but they offered us an authentic place to be real, and to share without shaming us, without smothering us, but letting us move forward and be Mm. loved well. Mm. And Jesus turns to Peter and says, when you have turned, go and strengthen your brothers. And so maybe you guys can speak to, after that experience, what the continued journey has been and how you've then moved forward in encouraging or strengthening others. Yeah, so that was that was 20 years ago, hmm. and it's crazy to to think that you guys pouring into us when it wasn't convenient for six weeks. I mean, you guys always have a million things going on that hmm. has allowed us to love each other well. Okay, it wasn't six weeks though; it was like eight right, that's months. Right, six, six weeks, right? Yeah, <laughs> of marriage. Hmm. That we, we can love each other well, but more than that, I feel like we were equipped to be vulnerable with other people and in turn pour into other people. 
because uh, life is hard, right? Life is hard, and marriage is hard. And sometimes we get the perception because because we're not you know we're not real with each other. We get the perception that that marriage is supposed to be easy or everything's like roses and butterflies. But you know, yeah, uni- unicorns. Okay, the struggle, and we shouldn't be ashamed when we struggle when we have hard times. Mm. And so we're we're in a life group, and and at Hillcrest we say one of our life group values is authentic community, mm. and with that comes vulnerability. And so we try, to, we try to model that in the group and other people, you know, we all, just hard times come up. And so we try to meet people where they're at. And, and it's one thing to, to, to know somebody struggling to say, man, I, uh, I feel that and I am, I'm sorry that you're going through that. Let me pray for you. That, that is something that is good to do. And yet it is something different to say, I'm going to come alongside you. And I'm going to meet you where you're at. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to listen. I'm going to, I'm going to be there for you. And, and, and through mm. that, hopefully, they can see that there's some hope on the other side of whatever they're going through. Mm, come on. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you, Georgie. That, that there is this real... Hang on one second. I just, I just land the plane here before you walk off. They just try to get, get off, off as quickly here. as you can. There is a real spiritual enemy, Right? That Jesus says, Simon, Simon, Satan demanded to have you like he would sift you like weak. And yet, Jesus prays. Jesus prays and brings people along with us in this journey. We're going to see Peter fall, and yet we're going to get to see Peter turn, much like we saw Aaron and Ryan turn through the support and encouragement of others on that journey. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Aaron. A real spiritual enemy that... that knows these areas that he wants to devour, to attack. And yet Jesus intercedes and prays that our faith would not fail. And we watch Peter fall, but then he turns. Here's what we see. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might thresh you like wheat. But I have prayed that your faith will not fail. And when you have turned again, help your brothers. But what did Peter say? Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. All these other people, yeah, I get that they need help, but I'm, but I'm pretty good. I got my life pretty much together. I, I don't really need any other help in my life. It, in my life, I, I'm good. I will actually go to prison or to death with you. Is that what happens? Eventually. But in the immediate, <laughs> there is this challenge that is taking place in his life. And John Owen describes that enemy pretty well. Who is that enemy that's going on? It's happening in our hearts. A castle or a fort may be ever so strong and well fortified, yet if there be a treacherous party within that is ready to betray it on every opportunity, there is no preserving it from the enemy. There are traitors in our hearts, ready to take part, to close and side with every temptation and to give up on all of them, yea, to solicit, to bribe temptations, to do the work as traitors incite the enemy. Peter says, (laughs) I'm ready to go to prison and to death with you. And then how does Satan attempt to sift him? Three times, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. And yet Jesus doesn't leave him there. He says, and when you have turned, strengthen your brothers. So how did Satan attempt to sift Peter? I think he was saying these words, you'll never be able to stand for Jesus at all. (laughs) That area of vulnerability that that he was so proud of was right where Satan attacked You'll never be able to stand for Jesus at all. After that first one, Peter denies, I don't know this guy. (laughs) After that second insinuation, I I don't know who Jesus, I don't know this guy. Or I think Satan also uses that other extreme. You don't need to stand for Jesus at all. Peter, why, why is this such a big deal? Why do you even need to stand for him at all? And so in the same way, Satan attempts to thresh us in our journey of faith. What are these lies that Satan attempts to tell us in this journey? Maybe one of these, don't write them all down, but maybe there's one that speaks most to your heart where you feel like these lies are threshing 
you. The idea that Satan tells us, you're not worthy of God's love. Who are you? What do you bring to the table? You're worthless. You're not worthy of the infinite God's love. Or, on the other extreme, God's lucky to have you. I mean, you know how good you are. We know how good you are. I mean, all those other people, they're suckers. But you, God is lucky to have you. Never aware of what might be lurking right around in that sense of pride. I'll go to death or to prison with you. God's lucky to have you. Another lie Satan tells us to thresh us. Your sin is too big for God's forgiveness and grace. Your life is so broken and scarred, it is beyond God's forgiveness. There's no way he could restore and heal your life. It is beyond his forgiveness. There's a way he's tempting to thresh your faith. Or on the other side, again, the other extreme, your sin isn't a big deal. Why are you worried about it? It's not a problem. No, you don't need to take it that seriously. It's no big deal. Another Satan, uh, another lie Satan tells us to thresh us. You can never be deeply happy. I know that guy, David, rants and raves about this joy in Jesus and, and how there's infinite pleasures at his right hand, but, but that's not really going to be true for your life. I mean, that's so far, you can't really have that depth of happiness in your life. Just keep suffering through a miserable life. And yet, that is this lie that Satan is attempting to thresh our faith, that Jesus isn't as satisfying as he claims. The other extreme of that, God's goal is to make your life easy. That he gives you this prosperity gospel of health, wealth, and prosperity. That, that's God's goal for your life. So if he's not, there must be something wrong with God because he's not giving that to you. Satan trying to thresh our faith, either to lull us to sleep or to weigh us down with difficult circumstances. What's another lie he might tell us? Your past is too damaging. You've had so many negative experiences in your life, Ryan and Aaron. There's no way your past is too damaging to heal. There's no way you can be restored. It's just too much challenges for me to overcome. What's a lie Satan might tell to thresh our faith and to lose trust in God's work in our life? Or your past is irrelevant. It's inconsequential. It doesn't matter what's gone on back there. That's, that's for then. It's what's happened. It's irrelevant. Versus when Peter fell and turned, God used his story for the encouragement and strengthening of others. You continuing to sin is not that big of a deal. We saw that one earlier. You're continuing to sin. That thing that just keeps rearing its head in your life, it's, it's not that big of a deal. You should not concern yourself with that too much. Or the other extreme lie, you are a disappointment to God. Why can't you figure this out already, Satan says? God must not be working in your life because you just keep returning. And yet, God cries to our life, you can't do something that would have him love you more or love you less. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Peter fell and he turned and began writing about this blessed hope. And then what we heard in Ryan and Aaron's story, you can never be used to help someone else. All that pain that's gone on in your life, that, that, is, that is inconsequential. Just stuff that and keep that to yourself. You are unable to help anyone else. <laughs> That's the lie. But the other extreme of the lie is attempting then to muster up enough help to help someone else without seeing God's work in it. And God is actually at work in this process. Satan is attempting to thresh our faith, to diminish our trust in God. And yet God is using those same circumstances to draw us to himself. Because why? What do we see in Peter's story? And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. That story, Peter, that I'm fully aware of where you're going to fall, your faith will not fail. I'm actually going to use that for my glory and your good, Peter. There is a real spiritual enemy 
We don't need to be told there are challenges in this life and do we see it through a spiritual grid. And yet, and yet we believe we're not left alone. Jesus prays and when Peter falls, God is actually redeeming him, empowering him. Peter turns and that he desires that our journey of faith encourage the faith of others. Now, we're not going to spend as much time on this one because I'm not fully sure what it's saying, but you guys are going to test this and figure it out. So I work through what is, what is Jesus' intent in sharing this story? Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat, but I prayed for you. And when you have turned, strengthen your brothers. Peter said to him, Lord, I'm ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you deny me three times that you know me. And then he said to them, When I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said, nothing. And he said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, sorry, did you lack anything? They said, nothing. He said to them, but now let the one who has a money bag take it. And likewise, a knapsack. And let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. And they said, look, Lord, here are two swords. He said to them, it is enough. So why is Jesus changing his encouragement? If you remember back to Luke 10, he gave them encouragement. Take nothing with you. God will provide. How could he give that encouragement earlier? When we believe that's still true, God does provide. Before, he could be giving that encouragement because people have a general positive disposition towards Jesus. They see these miracles. So if they find out you're with him, they're going to receive you positively. Again, this is one you can discuss in your life groups. So, so why does he give this encouragement? Luke 10, here's what he said. After this, the Lord appointed 72, sent them on ahead, two by two in every town. And he said, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. Go your way. Behold, I'm sending you out as lambs in the midst of wolves. So there's still challenges earlier, but carry no money bag, no knapsack, no sandals, and greet no one on the road. Why could he give that encouragement earlier? Possibly because they would receive him, them more warmly because of their connection to Jesus. Now, how will they be received? Negatively. They're not going to have a warm welcome. Here's what he says. Take no money bag, no knapsack, for I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors, for what is written about me has its fulfillment. They're not going to receive you as warmly this time. Why? Because they're about to treat me as a thief and a transgressor and murder me. And if you're associated with me, they will do so for you. And so carry no money bag, no knapsack. As you go, be aware and be prepared. And as we go, tomorrow's coming. We head back to our lives. Monday matters. And so as we head back to our lives... What what are we carrying with us that we are encouraged by from Jesus' words to Peter? I think this reality, we're in a war, always. I remember a conversation I had about a year ago. Uh, Things were escalating in different ways, and someone said, David, did you see what's going on, Russ? This is crazy. And I turned to them, and I said, welcome. I'm glad you're finally here with us. This is not new. Now, maybe it's accelerating to some degree, but this is nothing new. There are challenges where Satan is trying to sift people like wheat. We are in a war always. Do you have eyes to see that? As we enter our world, there's the lens. View life as an integration of the physical, emotional, intellectual, and spiritual dimensions. Primarily spiritual. As you go through your life, do you have eyes to see that the people we interact with aren't enemies, they are prisoners of war, that Jesus' kingdom advances in their hearts and lives, bringing healing and restoration through this spiritual lens? And then as we go through that, do we condemn ourselves when we fall in this journey? I'll ask one more time, Jerry, what do you think? Think I'll get an answer this time? Do we condemn ourselves as we move forward and occasionally fall? Do we condemn ourselves? I hope the answer is Romans 12. There's no, Romans 8, there's no condemnation for those in Christ. 
We don't beat ourselves up and condemn ourselves. Instead, it's not you have to clean up before you come to Jesus. You come to Jesus and he restores our lives. There is no condemnation. We don't condemn ourselves when we fall. Jesus is praying that our faith will not fail. No one can snatch you out of the Father's hands. That Jesus, Peter says, God guards our faith. We do not condemn ourselves when we fall, but what do we do? We're not paranoid. We're not afraid. We are awake. We are aware. We are on guard. We're aware that there's a spiritual enemy seeking to devour us. Not paranoid, not afraid, but we keep moving forward with this hope. And I hope you heard this in Ryan and Aaron's story, where we're looking for people we can help as people. That we're people helping people find life with Jesus one life at a time. We have spiritual eyes to see where someone might be feeling defeated. And we get to offer victory, the victory of the king. Now, do we give up on anyone? You heard a story of six weeks that turned into eight months. <laughs> do we give up on anyone? Man, there's times, there's times where we're, we're thinking, is this worth it? And don't hear me say it's not valuable to calibrate your investment in different ways. And yet we just heard a story of someone who spent from what was six weeks turned into eight months. Do we give up on anyone? It's framed as a question purposefully. Because in our hearts, we might evaluate where we're investing time, energy, resources, and we're not sure, is this, is this valuable? <laughs> what do we do? I hope this is our strategy that we employ as we go through our homes, our neighborhoods. God, what are you inviting me into today? And it's with unhurried time and open hands we move in this life, usually, usually with some activity, Sometimes over food, food is a wonderful tool, but it's a conversation that happens over time, and I sure wish it happened faster. And yet it's not making people projects, but it's sticking around long enough to see friendships born and to see lives changed. And then, do we still fall sometimes in that journey? Does that invalidate the story we're inviting people into? Because that would be the accusation. And maybe you've even heard that accusation from someone. Well, your life's pretty screwed up too. You go, yeah, welcome to the club. Even though we still fall sometimes, that doesn't prevent us from inviting people into life with Jesus. I'm going to invite the worship team up. As you move through this life, do we hear the words of encouragement to Peter? Peter fell and yet Jesus says, when you have turned, strengthen your brothers. It's showing that vulnerability and authenticity that invite people into a deeper, fuller experience of what is changing our lives. Pray with me, and we will continue in worship. Jesus, you are so good. Thank you for the work you have done, are doing in our life. Help us to trust that when we fail, when we fall, you are, you are praying and interceding that our faith will not fail. That when Satan threshes us like wheat, we can find confidence that you are interceding on our behalf. And that we can turn and strengthen others. Thank you, Jesus. Always for your glory we pray.